Isaiah chapter 26. <clears throat> Let's begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Isaiah 26, verse 1, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. That's one of my favorite Bible verses right there. Verse 4, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high, the lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground, he bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Now this chapter opens with this thought. It says, in that day shall this song be sung. I don't know if uh, many of you have you've read through this chapter. You've uh, probably, like myself, you probably uh, cling to a verse like number three, verse number four perhaps. I mean, what a wonderful uh, set of verses those are. But I don't know if you've ever noticed, I don't know that I'd ever noticed that this is a song that's going to be sung. I, I don't know that I caught that part. I know that it's scripture and I know that it's a, a wonderful passage, but he says this is going to be a song that's going to be sung in the land of Judah. Now, based on uh, reading the chapter and reading the previous chapters, I would uh, say that this song will be sung when the Lord Jesus Christ returns uh, at the second advent. We've talked a lot about these events, so I don't think I have to go into as much background this morning. I think I can deal more with what's at hand, but uh, you know the next thing awaiting the church is the rapture. We're going to leave out of here. There's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble that will last a, uh, about seven years on this earth, and then we will return with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second advent. That's very likely what this song is referring to and as a matter of fact at the second coming the Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom on this earth. It's a thousand year period of time. Now you note in verse number one it says in that day. Well what day is the Bible speaking of and you have to go back to Isaiah chapter 25 in order to see this if you would look at Isaiah 25 and look at verse number nine. Uh, he's telling you some things here. He says, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. What a wonderful passage. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What a lovely uh, passage. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says here, and, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees and uh, fat things full of marrow and uh, of wings on the, uh, or of wines, I should say, on, on the leaves well refined. And so he says, look, this is a time when the Lord's going to uh, establish a kingdom here on this earth and he's going to feed his people and he's going to provide uh, for them. If you look down to verse number 10, the Bible says, for in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest uh, and Moab shall be trodden down under him even as straw is trodden down for the dung hill and he shall spread forth his, uh, his hands in the midst of them as uh, he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. Now, now you can imagine that. This is talking about how the Lord's going to destroy his enemies. I know, you know, some folks, uh, is, you know, they'll swim like this and, and, uh, and, and do that. Some folks, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do like this. I'm sure there's other ways I don't uh, know about. But the idea is the Lord's just basically going to wipe out his uh, enemies and take them down. It, it's going to be that simple. 
And the Lord's going to establish a kingdom for his people. The Bible says he's going to, uh, verse number 12, the, the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. Now verse number 1 of chapter 26. In that day, the day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the earth uh, for the Jews to establish his earthly kingdom to destroy their enemies. In other words, when the Lord Jesus comes back to make things right, they're going to sing this song. And so that's kind of the context that you have. If you look here in verse number one, it says uh, they'll sing this in the land of Judah. And here's the song. We have a, a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. The idea there is the walls are salvation. The bulwarks are salvation. It says this in verse two. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. In other words, open the gates and allow uh, those uh, Jews and, and other nations, we don't have time to get into that, but other nations to, to go in uh, to that uh, wonderful kingdom. Verse number three, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. A great time of, of peace. He says, trust ye in the Lord forever for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now, I, uh, I'm full aware of the context. I understand that in this passage, we're talking about Jews. And this is very much uh, written to the Jews. But I, I think this is also true. Mankind is mankind. It doesn't matter whether he's a, uh, a Shemite, uh, whether he's from Ham or, uh, uh, or Japheth. None of that stuff matters. Uh, at the core, man is man. Okay, and uh, if the Lord uh, uh, points out something to us about the Jews, and we understand there are minor differences, the Jews require a sign, and, and the, the Greeks seek after wisdom. We understand that there are minor differences between people, but at our very core, if the Jews struggle with something, we will struggle with something. If we struggle with something, they're going to struggle with something. If there's uh, an emotion or a mix of emotions that the Jews feel, we very likely will experience the same things. And I think you find as we, you know, I, I like to tell you what the passage actually says. I don't want to just get up here and spiritualize everything. I want to tell you what the context is and what's going on in the passage. But uh, far uh, more than I could ever imagine, I find that there's also an application to me and you in those passages. We find here that the, uh, the Jews are going to sing a song and they're going to rejoice in the fact that Jesus has shown up and there's peace and uh, in him is everlasting strength. And what a great thing that you find there. The Lord's going to deliver the Jews. Look, I understand uh, maybe it's a little different, but we're all looking for everybody in this room, if you're saved, you're looking forward to a time when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up for us and takes us out of here and we no longer have to deal with all the frustrations and the heartaches, the death, the separation, the health, the, all the struggles of life. One day, very soon, Jesus is coming and he will deliver us from all of that. Amen. And thank God that heaven is not going to be filled with health issues and financial issues and and all the, the, the mess that this world's filled with. Thank God, deliverance is soon coming. And that's what those Jews were excited and singing about. Now notice that they're, the song is written long before their deliverance comes. They're rejoicing in the fact that God is going to deliver them before he actually does so. Now you look here, he's going to open the gates for the righteous to enter in. He's going to keep them in peace who have put their trust in him. He's uh, offering everlasting strength. Look with me, if you will, to verse number 5. The Bible says, For he, talking about the Lord, the Lord Jehovah, he bringeth down them that, are, that, that dwell on high, the lofty city. He layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. So the, the, uh, the enemy, very likely connected to Babylon here and all that kind of stuff, but he says that he's going to bring it down. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. In other words, the Jews are saying, uh, the Lord, when he returns, when he comes back, he's going to destroy our enemies that have harmed us and persecuted us and, and mocked us and ridiculed us. They'll be destroyed. And they're singing about this. Verse number seven, it says, the way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright. I like that. He says, look, Lord, you know, you watch the way of the just and you know the way of the just is uprightness, but let's, Stop for a minute. You're the most upright. 
So if anybody's going to take note of those who are striving to do right, those who love you and want to please you, it's not going to be the just on the earth. It's going to be the one that's most upright. And so he says, uh, we know that you've watched these things. You weigh the path of the just. Verse number 8, he says, Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to, thy, and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, talking about when the Lord's judgments are in the earth, very likely another reference to the future, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. You know what he's saying, Lord, there's a, a group of folks here on this earth and I know he's speaking personally. It's kind of like a, it's almost like you're getting a testimony of the Jews overall, but then you're getting a testimony of the prophet all mixed in one. And he says, Lord, I've longed for you. I've been waiting to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you come back. I would love for you to come back now. I've waited for you. I've longed for you. My spirit within me has said, I'll seek you early. I mean, everything about my life cries out that I'm ready to see my Lord. And what a great testimony that that is. And, and he says, uh, you know, I, I'm longing for you and I'm, I'm, I'm desirous to see you. And I, I dare say that there are, Folks in this room, maybe to varying degrees, but you're longing to see the Lord. I mean, your, your life revolves around that. I mean, you, you, those of you with children, you're trying to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're, uh, you're here at church. You, you, you enjoy singing His praises. You, you enjoy being able to sit down and read the Bible and, and you, you think about the Lord. Maybe, I'm sure all of us could say we wish we thought about the Lord more than we do and we wish we'd sing to the Lord more than we do and we wish we'd read more Bible than we do. We wish we'd pray more than we do. We wish we'd uh, do more with our families regarding the Lord than we do and all of us have that but still inside of you, you love the Lord and you're thankful. He saved you from hell. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to the lake of fire. You'll never step foot in hell or the lake of fire ever, ever, ever. You'll never go there. Amen. And so deep down in your heart, you know nobody has ever been as good to me as the Lord. And though I have regrets and I wish I would give him more of my thoughts and I wish I'd give him more of my life and I wish I'd give him more of, uh, of every part of me, Deep down inside, I love him. I can't wait to see him. I long for him. I, I, I long to be with him. I long to be apart from this, uh, this world. And I long to just be with Jesus, the one who died for me, the one who willingly, publicly died on the cross for my sins. I can't wait to be with him. And I think that's kind of the idea. Now, he's not talking about what Jesus did for him on the cross, but there. The idea is, I can't wait. I've longed for you. I've sought you out early. The desire of my soul is to, is to your name. I've, I, I like this in the first part of verse 8. Yea, in the way of thy judgments. You know what he's saying? I've been walking in your truth. In the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. We've been walking, we, we've been walking in your truth and waiting for you. That's, that's wonderful, isn't it? If you would skip on down to verse number 12. He says this, Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought in, uh, all our works in us. O Lord, our, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Here's the idea. It says we've, been, uh, we've had to submit ourselves and been under the authority of, of other lords, other gods. And you can imagine those Jews in times of captivity. And, and boy, you, you bow the knee now. We talked about that last week. I won't go there too much. But uh, they, they understand this idea that we've, uh, we've been in strange lands with strange people, with strange gods. And we're tired of being surrounded by this uh, uh, wickedness, uh, stupidity, uh, foolishness, uh, folly. I mean, just uh, 
a heathenistic way of life. And, and listen, the more we live and the longer we live in this country, the more we kind of get tired of living around folks who just don't understand, who, uh, who don't believe there's a God, who uh, believe that they're their own God and, and uh, they're sacrificing this and they're sacrificing that. and I mean, they're fighting for the right to marry and then they're fighting for the right to divorce and, and it's just nonsense and we get tired of being bombarded by stupidity, don't we? You just... I mean, you, 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 you listen to the news and boy, it's just, I mean, people are just, I don't know. I, I know this is going to sound weird, but I almost think we live in a country full of people who are brainwashed. I don't know what's going, people say things and I think, what are you talking about? And it's just crazy the way people think. And the, the, the writer here says, we, we've had to submit ourselves to these false gods. And he says, but Lord, you destroy them, you kill them, they don't live anymore. We're not under their authority anymore. We've got one Lord and one King. Listen, I'm looking forward to the rapture of the church, but I'm looking forward to the kingdom too. That's going to be pretty neat stuff. I mean, what a thing to have a righteous king on a throne for once. Uh, you do this, all right, no rain for you, buddy. I'm like, sick them, Lord, sick them, you know? I mean, that kind of thing. Oh, you don't want to worship with us? Oh, you're getting it now. I mean, that's just my, you say, well, you're just mean. Okay, you figured it out. I've been that way for a long time, all right? But I mean, what a, what a wonderful thing to have a righteous king on the earth. And I think the, the Jews are saying one day, one day, one day, no more babies being sacrificed and no more wickedness and no more unrighteousness because Jesus will be all in all. You find in verse number 15, he says, uh, begins to talk about some troubles the Jews have faced. He says, thou hast, uh, thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation, thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far into all the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Uh, the Jews, uh, when they're in trouble, they... Cry out to the Lord to ask him for help. That's what he's talking about in verse 16. Verse 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain, and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. Verse number 19. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Verse number 20, verse number 21, the Lord talks about, or he talks about the Lord coming back to set things straight. Look with me, if you will, to verse number 10. I want to give you the different perspective, the different emotion that's going to be felt on that day. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Look at verse number 11. Here it is. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people when the Lord Jesus Christ returns there are going to be some folks that say we've been longing to see you we've been thinking on you our soul has desired you our, our, the desire of our soul has been to your name everything about our life has been about you we've longed for this day we've longed for the day when you would return to this earth and destroy our enemies and set up our kingdom. But verse number 11, he talks about a different group of folks. Verse 10, he calls them the wicked. Now, I think we've got to be careful here not to exclude ourselves. Just because we're not uh, wicked in the fact that we're saved, we still have wicked thoughts, wicked minds, and those kind of things. But look at verse number 11. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. You see, the Lord is going to come back. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to destroy the enemies. But, but Isaiah says, Lord, there's two different emotions concerning your return. One is folks have been longing for you and waiting for you and couldn't wait to see you and couldn't wait to be with you and couldn't wait for you to destroy the enemies and couldn't wait for you to establish the kingdom and all those things. That's one side. But then he said there's going to be some other people. And those people have shame. Well, why would they have shame? 
In the context of the passage, it says they'll be ashamed for their envy at the people. See, while one group of people was looking heavenward and thinking about the Lord and thinking about the Scripture and thinking about the truth and thinking about uh, how they wanted to uh, be obedient to the Lord and thinking about how they wanted to please the Lord and thinking about how much they loved Him and how much uh, He loved them. And while they were thinking on all those things, there's another group of people that spent their entire lives consumed with wanting stuff and what other people had and envying people and and they had their eyes on stuff and people and, and things. So you got one group of people over here. They said, we've been waiting for this day for a long time. And here it is. And what a great blessing it is. And we're looking forward to when uh, the Lord comes back. And they're excited to see him. And you got another group of people over here uh, that, that say, uh, we're, we've been uh, looking at stuff and people and living for stuff. Living for people and stuff and things. And, and we've been consumed by other things. And a day that ought to be a day of rejoicing for everybody, really, shouldn't it? I mean, when Jesus Christ comes, everybody should be excited to see him. Whether it's second coming and setting up the kingdom or whether it's the rapture of the church, we should all be excited to see Jesus. It's the best, uh, I mean, maybe the second best after your salvation, but it's the best thing ever to happen to us if Jesus were to show up. But the Bible says, be warned that the way you spend your life can rob you of a little bit of joy when Jesus shows up. You say, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. Well, John over in his epistle said that there are going to be some folks ashamed. That is coming. I know we get all caught up in stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff in this world to get caught up in. I mean, it's unrealistic. And even the best of people, right? I mean, I'm not just talking about folks out there. I'm talking about, I believe you folks are good people. Uh, you all have been good to us. I mean, you're just fine folks. But we're all prone to get caught up in stuff. There is no doubt in my mind that I have failed the Lord uh, very likely on a daily basis. I mean, I just, I hate to say that, but it's, it's true. There are times I think things that I shouldn't think. Times I get occupied in uh, stuff that just don't matter and probably shouldn't be involved in and, and all that kind of stuff, just like you folks. We're all normal people. But when Jesus sounds, when that trumpet sounds and, and I see Jesus, I don't want to experience any shame. I don't want to lose any rewards when I get to the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want my works to burn up because my motive was impure. See, the Lord looks at our hearts. Sometimes we look at people and say, well, look at all they're doing for the Lord, but, but I think the Lord judges a little differently than we judge. I think the Lord's able to look beyond uh, what somebody does and see why the person does it. He's able to look at the heart. And this morning, you know what the Lord's doing? He's examining hearts. Mine and yours. He knows whether you genuinely love him or he knows whether you're going through the show. He knows whether I love him or he knows whether I'm just faking. Okay, the Lord knows. The Lord knows our hearts. When I stand before him, I don't want that meeting that should be the greatest, wel most welcoming meeting ever to be a time where my head is hung low because in my mind I'm thinking, oh, the years that I wasted. Oh, the time that I wasted. Oh, the thoughts that I wasted. Oh, the money that I wasted. Oh, the, the, the service that I threw down the tubes. You understand? What I don't want to greet him and be thinking, I wish I had done more. Two different ways folks met him. Right there in that passage, Isaiah 26. Some folks been thinking about him, been waiting for him, been longing for him. But then Isaiah says, you know what? There are others who just don't care. They've spent their lives being envious at others. And when Jesus shows up, they're going to be ashamed. I don't want anybody in this room, nobody in this room to experience shame 
when Jesus Christ shows up for the church. I want us to all rejoice that we gave our all to Jesus because he, you know this, he gave his all for us.